John chapter 8 John chapter 8 I will read verse 32 and then I will skip 33 and read 34 and uh, to 36 okay I am reading from the New King James Version, so it might sound a little different from your version. Uh, we, we all have different versions of the Bible. Um, I will read to the end of which I will say that is the word of the Lord, and you will respond by saying, Okay, with a little more confidence. Indeed, John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And that is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful, amazing opportunity to sit under the ministry of your word. I pray, my Father, that as we look at the scriptures, that you would reveal yourself to us and you would reveal Jesus to us. In the end, that we would see the example that you are calling us to. So we ask in our helplessness that what we do not have, you will give us. What we are not, you will make us. And what we do not know, you will teach us. We ask this humbly and in the precious, mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So sin no more. That's what we talked about on the first Sunday. And we asked ourselves, why is it that Christians continue to sin? Why are we held in habits and addictions? And then we talked about respectable sins, and the question we were answering that day is, as Joshua said, are there sins that are greater or bigger than others, and are there sinners who are more sinful than other sinners? And then we also answered the question, why is it that we are not bothered by our sins? And we read from 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, we have fleshly desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and these things drive us to want to satisfy ourselves and find um, help in places we should not be finding help. Last week we talked about fear. and We saw that fear is talking the life out of many Christians. Out of many Christians. Many Christians today are living a defeated life because of fear. We established that Fear is as much a sin as other sin, and it is always around us, it is within us, and it is one of the things that causes us not to live a joyful, fruitful life in the presence of our God. Today the question I want us to contend with as we come to the end of this series is, do we have a role to play in maintaining our freedom in Christ? Do we have a role to play in attaining the godly life? that Christ and God has called us to live. Now, I want to begin by saying that, and making it very clear, that I am not here to preach salvation by works. In fact, I am a convicted Calvinist. Please don't try to figure out what that means. <laughs> I believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. I believe in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I also believe in John chapter 2 verse 9 that salvation belongs to our God. I am not here to preach salvation by works. I am here to tell you that a gardener does not plant his garden then goes away and hopes to come back three or six months later to find a harvest ready for him. Brother, the gardener has to stay. The gardener has to be present and take care of the crops. The gardener has to water the crops and to prune and to weed and to look out for pests 
and diseases. The farmer has to work the garden in order to yield a good harvest. And that, friends, is the nature of our faith. That as much as we have been given this salvation for free and there is nothing in your power that you have done or you will ever do to attain that salvation, as much as God has given it to us for free, and as much as eternity is assured for us, as much as we will never be able to lose our faith, our salvation, we do have a responsibility. We do have a role to play in tending and taking care of the garden of our faith. You see, we cannot claim to be born again and continue to blame our weaknesses and imperfection for our continued darling and courtship and friendship with sin. We have a responsibility to resist the devil. We must be diligent in our pursuit of godliness. We must be diligent in our pursuit of holiness. Of holiness. We cannot be lazy. You cannot afford to be lazy about your faith. Christians may be very industrious in other parts of their lives. You are very committed to going to the gym and looking good. You are very committed to your studies. You are very committed to your business, to your home, to your ministry, to your marriage and families. There are things we are so committed to, but when, we, when it comes to our faith, we become lazy. And because of that laziness, where we should enjoy a life of freedom and fruitfulness, we are living a life of defeat, caught up in habits that we should be struggling with. We forget that above all things, our priority should be the pursuit of godliness because godliness matters more than your family, than your gym, than your business, than everything else because all these other things are just added unto you. Your pursuit of Holiness and godliness should be more important to you because it is the only thing that matters in eternity. All these other things are just added to you and you will leave them here. Your ministry, your career, your home, your studies and all these things, you will leave them here. And so you do have a responsibility and a role to play as far as Living a godly life and owning your freedom is concerned. Please turn to First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. I will read verse seven and eight. Here's what it says: Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather. Train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for the present life and the life to come. Look at what Paul is saying to Timothy. Train yourself to be godly. Essentially, what Paul is telling Timothy is that you are responsible for your godliness. You are responsible for living a godly life in this earth before eternity. It is not a matter that you can live in the hands of Jesus. You have a role to play. You have a personal responsibility. And secondly, you have a personal responsibility to grow. You have a personal responsibility to to, to Pursue righteousness and godliness and love and faith and endurance and gentleness. And then you have to make a commitment. So the principle of personal responsibility, the principle of growth, and the principle of commitment to your growth. These are the principles that I want us to contend with today, my friends. That we have a role to play in owning our freedom. We bear personal responsibility to commit to grow in godliness. This principle.
principles are the principles behind scriptures such as work out your salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. They are the principle behind Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 where Paul says, I press on to take hold of that which Jesus Christ has taken hold of me. This is the principle, these are the principles behind Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 that exhorts us to make every effort to be holy. Make every effort to be holy. Those are your efforts. There's the principles behind 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 to 9. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is near-sighted and blind, Forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. You have a role to play. You have a role to play. What does that role look like? The first thing you need to do as a child of God in training yourself to be godly, you need to commit yourself to pursuing God with all your heart. Pursue God with all your heart. You see, your greatest need, child of God, your greatest need is not the need for food, is not the need to be dressed, is not the need for company or marriage. Your greatest need is the need for God. Because all of your needs can only be met in the presence of God. God wants, He can, and He will meet your needs and it doesn't matter what those needs are, whether they're emotional, for happiness, for being stress-free, for, for having peace. God is interested in meeting those needs. Whether they are physical, for food, for water, for shelter, for clothing, healings, and for single guys, did you know that even your sexual needs, you cannot scratch your need for God with a sex utensil. Your needs, everything you need for life and godliness is in the presence of God. Pursue God, saying like David in, in Psalm 63 verse 1, You, God, are my God. Honestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. In the presence of God, your needs are met. But we confuse that, the emptiness, the hollowness, our need for God, we confuse it with needs for other things. And that's why in the pursuit of, 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 of a fulfillment, of a fulfilling thing, we are caught up in struggles, in addictions, in things that we should not be struggling with because we are confusing our need for God with the need for other things. Growing in godliness means pursuing God and seeking Him. As He says in Jeremiah, He promises in Jeremiah 29, 13, You will seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. Pursue God with all your heart. Make it your primary business. Make it that if it is the only thing you ever do, pursue God with all your heart. You pursue God by having an undying and wavering commitment to His Word. The Word of God. You see, to live the Christian life without investing in reading and studying God's Word is like hoping to reap from a garden you have not planted, you have not worked. The intake of God's word is perhaps the most crucial element of training ourselves in godliness. 
I need you to understand this. God is not separated from his word. God is not separated from his word. Scriptures are a gift, God's gift to us, for us to be able to know him. Scriptures reveal to us God. They are a revelation of God, the character of God, the person of God. And they are also our, a, a, his revelation of us and our need for him. Scriptures help us. If you ever want to hear God's voice, if you ever want to know that God speaks, just go to his word. Investing in God's word will help you to be able to deal with questions like, how do I know God spoke to me? How do I know God's will for my life? The, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. We struggle with these questions because we do not invest in God's word. So we do not know his character. And let me tell you, the devil speaks. The devil speaks. Your fears and anxieties speak. Your needs speak. You need to invest in knowing God for who he says he is so that when he speaks, you will know this is God. And when the devil speaks, you can respond to him and tell him, it is written. That only comes by investing time in God's word. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of God and find knowledge of God. God reveals himself to us. We are just so lazy to find him. He has given us precious gifts in his word. And when you read God's word, do not just go to the, the texts that make you feel good. Don't just go to Jeremiah 29, 11 and say, for I know the plans that I have for you. And most often quote it out of context. Paul says to Timothy, all scripture is God read and it's useful in teaching, rebuking, uh, correcting and training in righteousness. Go to God's word, yes to feel good, but also go there to be rebuked and admonished, to be shown for who you are, to be exposed so that you can repent. Amen. Invest in God's word, invest in hearing God's word. And this generation does not have a deficiency of good teachers of God's word. So there is no excuse. We have the Bill Heidels, the Timothy Kellers, the John Pipers, the Sama Dayanis, the Bishop Oscar Moreau, the Pastor Bowies, and the Nairobi Chapel South YouTube channel. You have all those. <laughs> Why? Won't you invest in hearing God's word? And then read God's word. No, not just hear it, read it for yourself. Be like the Bereans when Pastor Olunga preaches, go like they did in Acts chapter 17 verse 11. Go and search for yourself and see, he said this, is it really in scripture? Mm. Read God's word. Read God's word. Commit to reading God's word and commit to reading God's word from Genesis to Revelation and see the story of Christ, the story of redemption. Do not, do, not, do not be those Christians who are saying, eh, me, I, I don't do a Bible reading plan. I just read, I just open the Bible randomly as the Spirit leads. <laughs> that is laziness. That's laziness. If you do not shed you, it won't happen. That's what my boss taught me. That's what Pastor Bowie taught me. If you do not shed you, it, it won't happen. And so when I hear, and I am fighting this with some friends of mine, when I hear you say, I, I just read scriptures as a spirit lead, it just shows me this, this is a lazy Christian. Yeah. Then you don't, you don't lack uh, plans for reading scriptures. You have Google. And if you can't spell, Google will ask you, did you mean? <laughs> you have Google to search for plans. You have apps that have Bible reading plans. You have no excuse. And then studying God's word. 
Study God's word. Spend time with the questions that you wrestle with. Find what God's word says about your marriage. Find what God's word says about your job, about your money, about the things you struggle with. The Bible has all the answers for life. You just need to spend time in it. And then meditate on God's word. Meditate on God's word. Pick a verse and reflect on it day and night as God's command to Joshua. This week I have been reflecting and meditating on 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 20. Where God gives victory to Israel over the Hadrites in the battle. And he says, he gave them victory because they cried out to him. Because they cried out to him. And I have areas in my life where I need victory. And that reminded me how much I need to cry. I have committed myself this year by God's grace, and I hope, I'm just saying this hoping that you can learn from it, that by God's grace I will read through Genesis to Revelation at least twice, that I would study the Gospels, uh, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just see Jesus. And then applying scriptures, make all effort, reading and studying and, 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 and memorizing and meditating on scriptures, this will not, does not, in, its, in, in and of itself is not enough if you're not going to apply it to your life. Let me give you an example of applying scriptures. So I broke up with a lady. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know what we do when we, when we break up? You know, we go to social media. WhatsApp. <laughs> And Instagram. And then you start saying things like, find someone who will not, you know, those, those things. <laughs> <laughs> and then I read Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. The Bible talks about Joseph when he discovered that Mary was pregnant. Mary, if you discovered that your wife is pregnant by another. What would you do? The Bible says that Joseph, because he was a just man, he fought to deal with this matter privately. He didn't go to social media. <laughs> and don't tell me there were no social media, there, there were tablets. <laughs> God convicted me of my stupidity and selfishness. And I am applying that scripture in a situation like that. Commit yourself to not just hearing, reading, memorizing and meditating on God's word, but also to applying it. It is in the applying of God's word that you become like Jesus Christ. Cultivate a lifestyle of worship, number two. Worship is not just a song. It's not the slow song we sing here on Sunday morning. It is a lifestyle. It is a state of the heart. It is an undying devotion to God. It is what drives the fear of God in us. It is the love for God that is worship. It is living with a thankful heart. It is living with a thankful heart in gratitude for what God has done for us and how far he has brought us. A worshiper's heart is gripped by holy sorrow and remorse for sin. David was a worshiper. King David was a worshiper. When he fell with Bathsheba and ended up committing murder, his heart, because he was a worshiper, was gripped by such sorrow that David produced one of the most beautiful pieces on confession ever written, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your love and kindness. A worshiper's heart is gripped 
by soul. A worshiper loves God more than the ordinary person. A worshiper sings songs of praise. A worshiper prays more than the ordinary person. A worshiper has a lifestyle of prayer and praise. And it is in our prayer and praise that God dwells. It says in Psalm 22 verse 3, God inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of worshippers. Cultivate a lifestyle of worship. And then, number three, leave, and I want you to write the next word in caps. Leave in radical accountability. Notice, I have not just said accountability, I have said radical accountability. Accountability is living in a community of believers who call you out. Living in a community of believers, in a community of believers who call you out. Unfortunately, in our times, Christian communities do not help to build each other up. Instead, we have become dense of gossip and slander and celebrating and tolerating sins in the name of extending grace. <laughs> yeah, and we, oh, here we don't judge. <laughs> here we don't judge. And tell you something. I will judge you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because the Bible says, you cannot judge a non-believer. That's God's work. But the church judges. Do you not know, Paul says, do you not know that you will judge even angels? Imagine you will judge angels. Who are you not to be judged here? <laughs> <laughs> Living in radical accountability is having a community that admonishes one another. Rebuking one another. You see, extending grace does not mean we don't call people out of the sins they struggle with. Calling people out of sin means we love them so much that we do not want them to miss eternity. Our motivation for calling people out of sin is love for them. We call people out of sin not because sin, their sin is disgusting or because they make us angry, but because we don't like what the sin is doing for them. To them. It's about them getting lost. It's not about you when you call somebody out of sin. Sin is strong. Unfortunately for many of us, we are the SI unit in our accountability relationship. We are in accountability relationships where we are the best thing that ever happened since roasted peanuts and black tea. <laughs> you should try that thing. You should try that. Just the as a black team. My grandmother makes that stuff very well. We are in a accountability relationship where people fear us, where they, are lo they love us, they admire us, and worship the very ground on which we walk. We are untouchable. Some of us here need to go home and evaluate our friendship and our accountability relationship, and we need to quit some of those. Let me give you an example. If you're in an accountability relationship, where you go and tell someone you're struggling with something, and then they tell you, hey, where are you? Where do you meet me? <laughs> you see, when I come to you to confess, that moment is not about you. So whatever it is you're struggling with, I don't care. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Because, listen, the, 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 the tendency is for us to leave accountability relationships where we have confessed to one another, we leave those accountability relationships feeling that we are better, like we are better than the other people because they are struggling. And then we become okay because there are people who are struggling more than we are. If you have friends who, when you go to confess, they tell you, I'm struggling more than you're struggling, quit. Quit, a friend of God. And then we have to be, radical accountability means living in a life devoted to honest, honest, honest confessions. 
We are exhorted in James chapter 5 verse 16, confess our sins one to another and pray for each other that we may be healed. This means being open with our friends about what we struggle with. We need to have our lives, to live our lives with people who love us enough to allow us to confess to them. We need to have friends who know us very well and can see through our pretense. Friends who make us uncomfortable by speaking up to us the truth that disarms us and breaks the wall we build. And let me tell you, this is newsflash. When you made the decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you gave up your right to privacy. Child of God, as long as you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you do not have right to privacy. You gave it up. If you did, then you probably did not really follow Jesus. Jesus did not die in private. <laughs> Jesus was crucified on a hill, the most public place, and every private thing about him was exposed. You gave up your right to pray. Sin thrives in secrecy and privacy. Mm. It thrives in secrecy and privacy. So we need to have radical accountability partners who we can confess to in public. Authentic Christianity, my friends, authentic Christianity is lived in authentic Christian communities where people find love, they find accountability, they find belonging, care, discipleship, and fellowship where people tell each other the truth and people find a safe space to confess their sins. Authentic Christianity is lived in an environment where you are free to be naked and unashamed. That is authentic Christianity. It is not lived in private, my friends. And so, join an e-group. Join an e-group. It is for your good. Mm. Sign up for plug-in. It is for your good. Eternity is much more important than your privacy, friend. It is much more important than your privacy. I have an app on my phone and my computer called Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is an accountability software, okay, where it monitors everything I do on my phone and everything I do on my computer. All right? And then it generates a report and sends it to some people who are my accountability partners. Now, every internet, everything I do on the internet on my computer and everything I do on my phone is monitored. Okay? And then it generates a report and sends it to my friends. Some of these my accountability partners, some of these accountability people are people who can fire me. So if I ever went to a ridiculous site, then you know. I would rather that. I would rather that. And triumph over the powers and authorities in the same way that Jesus did in the cross according to Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Then number four is self-control and discipline. You see, you've got to answer the question, how bad do you want to be free? How bad do you want to be free? You see, the cycle of addiction, the cycle of your sin, that cycle ends where it begins, and it begins with you. It begins with you. There's no one coming from Master. It begins with you. Jesus comes to this man in John chapter 5. This guy has been lying here for 38 years. Been, he's been here for 38 years, waiting to get into the pool at Bethesda. Right? And Jesus is 30 years old. So he probably has grown up watching this man. And Jesus goes to him and asks him, do you want to get well? Now, Jesus, of course, knows that this man wants to get well. This is my interpretation. He knows. Because if he didn't want to get well, he would not be there. What Jesus is asking him, dude, how bad do you want it? 
Because you can have accountability. You can commit to reading God's word. You can commit, you can make all those commitments. But until you answer the question, how bad do I want it? You will struggle and make decisions and then go back to struggling and make decisions and go back to struggling and make decisions and cultivate a culture of perpetual repentance and confession. How bad do you want it? Self-discipline means you need to quit blaming your weaknesses and imperfections for your sins. That thing is a lie. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24 verse 10, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? There is no room for you to blame your... I'm just perfect. I'm just imperfect. No! No! Of course only Jesus is perfect. Only Jesus is holy. But you have been called to be holy. As he is, you can't live a life of blaming your imperfections, friends, for your lack of self-control. You can't. And then, number five, allow Jesus to make the difference where you fall short. Allow Jesus to make the difference where you fall short. Thank God for Jesus. Because where we fall short, He steps in. Jesus, three times on his way to Calvary, he fell. But every time he fell, he picked up his cross in his pain and powerlessness, physical powerlessness, and hunger and thirst and bleeding. And he got to Calvary. So that where you fall short, child of God, where I fall short, Jesus makes the difference for me. He is my strength. Where I can't on my own. He makes the difference. You don't have to struggle on your own. You don't. See, the psalmist says in Psalms chapter 73, verse 26, he says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but you, O oh God, are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Your efforts are meaningless if Jesus is not in Jesus steps into this world. So that where Adam fell short, he would make a difference. He, he, he comes so that where David fell short, the man after God's own heart fell short, Jesus stepped in and made the difference. And he wants to make the difference for you, child of God. Will you allow him? Will you allow him? I'm going to shortly invite us to the Lord's table and I'm going to invite the ashes to wait on us now. But listen. If you do not have Jesus, everything you're doing is pointless. Look to him for help. 